now that we just heard all about wearables and um, the potential pitfalls and, uh, and rewards that they can bring and where this is going, um, it's sort of an opportune time to address this subject maybe in a more um, granular way. It's actually, I have to say, I, I kind of hate the word wearables. It doesn't really make sense to me. I feel like anything you put on your body is theoretically wearable, correct? Right? Otherwise, you wouldn't put it on. Um, but apparently, when it comes to technology, that is not true. I say apparently because it is true. What isn't true is that, what also is true is that you may not want to put it on. You may not like the way it looks when it's on. You can put it on. You just don't want to. Because the truth is, often functionality and fashion do not go hand in hand. The best screen is a nice large square screen. The nicest watch face is a small curved watch face. Most bracelets people like tend to be metals, gold, platinum, silver. Metal interferes with radio waves. This creates problems. Yet as Will said, as consumers drive luxury and technology closer and closer together, these differences need to be resolved, especially because the wearable market has been predicted to become a $12.6 billion market over the next four years. So here to talk about how we put the two things together, we have a panel consisting of Diane von Furstenberg, designer, author, TV star, <laughs> women's rights advocate, um, and the first woman to ever put Google Glass on the runway, um, John Maida, a design partner at Kleiner Perkins, Stefano Rosso, chief executive of Only the Brave, the holding company for Diesel, which recently did a smart band with Samsung, and Babak Parvez, who is the man who actually led the team that gave us Google Glass and is now vice president of Amazon, where he has turned his attention to a broad array of technologies and what can be made with them. Thank you. Um, I think to start, I'd like to talk a little bit about what you each see as the, um, the kind of the state of play, where we are right now, and what the kind of the relationship is between um, fashion and technology in the wearable. Where does it start? You get to start. Oh, okay. Um, well, I am, as a person, as a designer, I'm always interested in solution driven, right? So it is not about, it's about solution driven. I am very happy that I am old enough to have danced at Studio 54 and young enough to have been part of the digital revolution. I love everything that's digital. I sleep with my iPad, I do everything, and, uh, and I'm fascinated by the incredible you know, horizon that, that has led to us. So for me, it's about solution, really. It's about you know, all these things, how can I reach, and how can I do it, and I, how can I make it in the most, I mean, in my case, in the most feminine, practical, effortless, sexy, and on the go. Uh -huh. That's the way I, I personally look at it. So um, I, um, I, I, I know a lot of people in technology. I had the great opportunity of, uh, of um, showing the Google Glass the first time really in public. Mm. And it was a complete accident, really, uh, because I'm a good friend with Sergey, the founder and um, the co-founder. And um, one summer, I saw him hidden behind a tree, and he was wearing these very odd things. And I said, what are you wearing? And he said, come and see, and he showed me. And then we started to talk, and I said, Sergey, have you ever been to a fashion show? And he said, no. I said, well, you should come in September to my fashion show. And that was that. And then about two weeks later, uh, I get a phone call from Sergey, and he said to me, how about bringing Google Glass on the runway? So I didn't really understand what he was talking about, but I said yes. And, uh, and then, you know, it was all very secret. Nobody could know, and people in my office couldn't know, and this one couldn't know. 
and um, and uh, and we decided that we were going to have the the models work um, walk on the runway wearing the Google Glass, and they would film. And so the makeup artists would be wearing uh, Google Glass, and everybody backstage would be wearing it and filming. And then the girls would be filming. And so you would be able to see, when the film was done, how it actually feels to be a model, which you've never been able to, to see. Mm -hmm. So first I had to convince people in my office, because they thought that those odd things would ruin the show. And I reminded them that you do a fashion show to have photographs taken. And that would guarantee that we would get photographs in the paper. And indeed, it, it, it did. And I dragged Sergey on the runway. And he made the triumph walk with me. And, and then they made an incredible movie, which about over 2 million people saw. And um, so that was my experience with Google Glass. And, uh, and then later, we designed a, a frame for it. But um, it was fun. And it happened a little bit by accident, but, but it was fun. OK, Babak, I'm going to skip to you, because we just heard Diane refer to them as weird, strange things. Um, I mean, is that what, how much were you thinking about aesthetics and what people would want to wear versus just what they could wear and what would work when you were developing them? Quite a bit, actually. I want to maybe take one minute and sort of tell everyone where these weird things came from. Because in the broader context of computing and mobile computing, they actually make sense. Uh, so if we go back about 40, 50 years ago, uh, you might remember the computers are big devices. They occupy big warehouses. Uh, and you had to get into your car to drive to a computer, an IBM facility maybe, to use it. And over the years, over the past few decades, this has dramatically changed. So we went from that to a personal computer that showed up in, in your house. So now it's in your living room, then to laptops. So they started to move around with people. Maybe it's in someone's br briefcase. Um, and in the past few, few years, we've had uh, mobile phones. Those are the leading edge of computing. Um, that now you can be seen with them in, in public. So this is actually becoming significantly uh, more personal. So these computing devices over the years have become much smaller, uh, much more mobile, much more personal. And one of the questions that we were asking ourselves a few years ago um, was, what can potentially come after the smartphone? What is the mode of computing? that is even more mobile, more personal, and more immediate to use. And Google Glass was one answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So these weird things actually have a reason to exist. And then you know, if time allows on this panel, we can talk about what, what you would use this, this particular type of computer uh, for. But also, from the very early days, it was pretty clear that this is very different from uh, your other devices. It's going to be on the person. It's going to be seen all the time. So we needed to pay attention to the design and how it looks and how it feels to wear a device like that. So we had our um, first uh, industrial designer within the first year of the program. And um, the industrial design team uh, was tightly integrated into the engineering team. And then obviously on top of that comes the UX and UI and all sorts of other types of design. Mm -hmm. But uh, quite important. So it was prominent from very early days. And were you surprised by people's reactions to the first Google Glass? I mean, did you expect them to think like, oh, it's, it's so gorgeous? Or did, you know, was it pretty much what you expected? So there was, uh, we got a lot of reactions to, to Glass actually when we announced it a couple of years ago. Uh, it was in 2012 that we made the program public and very gradually started to release prototype devices uh, to people. Um, I think 95% of it uh, was an extreme sense of excitement of what this platform can do uh, in terms of what the technology enables you to do. It enables you to capture moments that you would not normally capture. It enables you to access information in ways that were unimaginable even a couple of years prior to that. Um, and then we had 5% of the overall feedback from the community, which was about um, how it looked and also how the society would interact with these devices that are out and about. And there's a lot of issues related to that also. Um, but overall, I think that the initial reaction was extremely positive, and it was mostly about excitement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Stefano, for you, I mean, why the decision to work with um, Samsung on the, the bracelet? 
But you know, it was uh, more Why than a decision. Why do glasses? <laughs> Why do bands instead of glasses? <laughs> it was uh, an opportunity. So um, with Samsung, we have uh, we've been talking for a while, and uh, there was this opportunity. They had to launch their new their new watch, and uh, I believe they understood how they needed to have uh, something to make it more interesting and appealing to the consumers they were targeting. So they came to us, as they know, we are always open and keen on pushing innovation and do things uh, through a different perspective. And uh, we work together on this uh, makeup, if you want, special makeup for their, for their new, new watch. Um, it's not a full collaboration, it was more of a one-shot deal, but uh, I believe it's just the first step maybe of uh, other opportunities that, that uh, can come along on the way. Did you hear Will just speaking, saying that um, fashion should stay away from large tech companies because they will swallow them whole? <laughs> ah, I don't think so. Which would swallow which? Will, I am, was just <laughs> saying he would advise fashion companies to stay away from large tech companies. But everybody wants to be part, everybody wants to use fashion. I mean, if you sell meat, you want to use fashion. I mean, you, if you do anything, because Fashion is fashion, it's the air of the time. So technology, I mean, how did it happen that Sergey called me to have a thing? They just called, they probably had a marketing meeting and they say, okay, so, but right now it's only the very high tech people who know about it. How do we let the people know? They say, oh, somebody said the word fashion. So they say, oh, I have a fresh friend who is fashion designer. And then the next thing he called me and that, that's how it happened. Yeah. I, I think that anything that happens, at some point, people go to fashion to, because fashion is the conduit for everyone to see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry. John, do you, do, you, do you think that's true, that technology is going to fashion because it's a way to speak to a broader population, or do you think there's something more systemic going on with aesthetics and, uh, and functionality? Um. There's definitely something systemic going on. Um, I was at MIT for my career, my early career, and I led a school called RISD um, Design. Um, and then I was hired by the venture capital industry um, in January, Kleiner Perkins, to come in to understand what this design thing is and uh, why is it important all of a sudden. They didn't, and, they didn't understand? Um, most people <laughs> don't, actually. And, um, but they're open to asking why. Uh -huh. Um, and uh, I came up with a few conclusions. I've been in Silicon Valley for roughly 11 months now. Um, and there really is a simple, there's one simple piece that relates to your experience. It's the fact that um, technology companies make technology. Um, that's how they got famous. That's how they made an impact. Uh, design wasn't important because you would buy it because it was faster and better. Um, as we became full of all the features and the possibilities, we began asking questions about, like, how does it make me feel? Mm -hmm. So in the past, you'd make technology, you'd spray on the design. That was one way to do it. But now you have to put design from the beginning and go throughout and iterate, like you're saying. That's much more expensive. Um, so a lot of what I argue in Silicon Valley is that this isn't just a cost. It's now a necessity to put it through the whole stream. So how do you do that? I mean, do you take kids coming out of art school, you know, fashion students, and hire them at tech companies? Do fashion companies start putting, you know, hardware designers in their personnel department? I mean, you have to go back to the beginning. Is there a way to put them together now? What does that mean? That's a huge problem. Um, 20 years ago, if this didn't happen, it'd be okay. But for 20 years, technology has been leading everything. And technology didn't just, like, evolve linearly. It was exponential. So knowledge in design schools lags technology by a factor of um, tens of thousands to millions. So catch up is very hard. Mm. So what do you do? I mean, Stefano, did you have any sort of gaps in your conversation when you were talking to Samsung about the design of the bracelet? Was there anything you wanted to do or your designers wanted to do that of they were like, no, you can't do that? Of course. I mean, we were so limited that uh, our designers almost didn't want to do it because they came to us with a product that was finished. And uh, being a creative company, what you really want to do is to start from the beginning to have the concept behind the product uh, in, a, in order to be able to really push forward the creativity that is inside you. So for us, it was really an exercise to pimp something that was already existing. 
and I think the came out was uh, quite good, but uh, it's maybe 5% of the potentials that uh, creative companies can, can put behind these products. Mm -hmm. If we have the opportunity to be involved since the beginning, uh, from the idea that stands behind uh, to the final touch, the final materials, the final leather that you want to use. Mm -hmm. Dan, but, did you have the same problem when you were doing your No, classes? but I mean, look, look at Apple. I mean, Apple is the perfect example of technology and design. And Apple has become, you know, it's the most, you know, it's a luxury brand. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a luxury community that happens to, you know, is a technology company. But it is also fashion because they understood design from the beginning. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, at the end, it's all about solution driven. This is going to allow me to do that. I mean, you know, the iPhone, I mean, you know, and the sweep and the, and the iPad, and I mean, that is, it's just remarkable. And it was also well designed. Mm -hmm. Now, how does it get into the fashion world is then it's maybe the application. <coughs> how do you can put your iPad in a bag that you can use this, you know, and then fashion is kind of the vulgar, vulgarization. Uh -huh. You know, it's, that's the conduit. But Apple is the perfect example of a total marriage of design and technology. Mm. Babak, are you thinking about this sort of thing at, at Amazon now? Uh, that's, that's very relevant, and I think Diane has a really, really great point. So in, in my experience, and some of the more successful experiences I've seen, um, the, the collaboration has been very, very tight and very, very close. Um, and some of the very successful things that I can think of, including Apple, involves having the designers sitting really from the early on at the decision-making table um, and giving those people a voice of how this is going to evolve from day one. Uh, so a mistake that some tech companies make is that they develop something, they get excited about I'm a technical person myself, so I get excited about technology. They develop it for sometimes years, and then a week before they release it as a product, they say, oh, it doesn't look great, it doesn't interact with people right, it's not perceived right, let's go find a creative designer to fix it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. That no. The better way is to have the designers really sit at the decision-making table from day one and co-develop it. Because also the designers need to really know what the limitations of the technology are, so they can design around it sometimes, design with it, mm -hmm. and sometimes push the technology people to do better. And you know we see this day in, day out, and that's possible. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when you get an answer that it's impossible to implement X or Y in technology, that's not really true. It just mm -hmm. hasn't been tried before. So if the designer pushes back and the people who are executives make a decision, yes, that we're going to support our designers, amazing things can happen. And um, vision, vision, you know? I mean, Apple, I mean, there was, it was, there was a vision, and the vision, and how can we get this happen, and then how can we make it the most beautiful way? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't it a question of shared values from the beginning, though? You know, that both the tech side of something and the fashion side of something have to say, okay, you know, what do we care about? We care about the way something feels the way it makes you feel. Well, first the you care about what it does. And what it does. I mean, that's but the first thing. You have to decide where. No, the first is thing is what it does. I mean, what is the usage of this product? Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing, because if it doesn't have any usage, then who cares? But even if it has usage, I mean, talk about Google Glass, you know, even though it has really interesting Yeah, but Google Glass is one step, OK? It's the first step to something, mm -hmm. you know? So they have the computer. At first, I know because I remember uh, some of the designer I worked with, Isabel, who was on your team and who is a beautiful Swedish girl who is a technical designer and who worked for you. And, uh, and you know, at first, Google Glass was this huge thing. Mm -hmm. And then it became smaller and smaller and smaller. And, and it ended up being, you know, a tiny little thing that you put on your, on your head and you just hope you don't get a brain tumor. <laughs> John, what do you think? <laughs> Sorry about that. What do you, what do you think? What, what does it start with? 
<laughs> um, so I, I have one. What's going to happen to me? Um, I think it goes back to what, what I believe, and I think we've all been saying the same thing. You have to start with design, not just end with it. And going to this example that Diane's giving about Apple, uh, I gave a presentation in Silicon Valley roughly in February, and I brought my Apple IIc. Who knows what an Apple IIc is? Older people, thank you, older people. Um, it's, from it's roughly from 30 years ago. It's an Apple II that was shrunken. It was flat, it has a beveled edge, it has a handle, it has a green, beautiful green power switch, it has a recessed, it's a beautiful computer designed 30 years ago. Uh, it must have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars more to make, perhaps millions. It's a dumb idea from a business perspective, but it was done 30 years ago, and it was done every year since. So design is part of the culture of Apple. You can't just suddenly say, I want to get right. good. Right. You have to, this is a great right. fashion brands. You, you've been doing it for a long time. That's why you're good at that's it. Right. That's right. So that's what do you do now? That's why it's vision. Exactly. I mean, you, you work in venture capital. It's all about startups. Right. What do you do with someone who hasn't been doing it for a long time and says, well, this is my kind of end goal? Uh, a lot of what I do with startups in Silicon Valley is something very simple. Mm -hmm. It's aligning the organization to understand design not just its decorative or makeup That's properties, right. as you're saying, yeah. but for its business impact, That's right. its ability to push technology and to get designers, engineers, and business people to work together and realize, oh, this is actually a really useful thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, Stefano, for you, do you think you need to build that in-house, or do you think you can find it elsewhere? It's very complicated to build it in-house because you don't have all the, the tech part. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. But I think in wearable technologies, what's really the most difficult thing right now is to understand the needs of the consumers. That's right. Because at the end, we start making toys that have a million applications that you never use. That's right. And uh, we're just going to switch it from a phone now to something that you wear. The, by the way, 98% is either on your wrist uh, and now there are the glasses. So it's not even wearable. It's just a way to say it, but it's a device that stick to your wrist instead of being in your hand. It's like the bracelet, no jawbone, or no, one of those mm. that you, you, you put the bracelet on and you know how much, you know, you go up the stairs and you know how many calories and how many whatever. And I love that, it was great because I'm a hiker and I could see, oh, I'm doing so well. But I couldn't go in the, in the water with it. And I also swim, so all my swimming didn't count on the bracelet. <laughs> so I didn't like it, I threw it out. <laughs> So, I mean, how do you find out what the consumer wants? You know, say you're, you're a design house, you're but a tech I, I don't think that you, I mean, to think what the consumer wants is the wrong way to look at it. What you, the way to look at it is how can we make this, this happen? How can we make this happen? If this is happen, how can we make it happen? And then how can we make it happen in the most, agreeable way and also it, it's all solution driven it's all even clothes by the way anything it's about solution at the end right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John uh, I think the just sitting in this room and sitting with Diane here you know, my colleagues here it, it's about risk-taking and I think fashion allows us to push the edge of who we are uh, historically, traditionally. Mm -hmm. Technology now plays a role I want to salute you for that brave glass thing that was amazing no one tried that. That's a big step forward. Um, I think those risk-taking things are what this is all about in the end. Babak, I mean, Amazon's clearly a hugely consumer-facing company. So I want to actually go back to the, independent of Amazon, go back to the mode of how these things can come about. I 100% agree that first there has to be a vision of what they're used for, what is the usefulness of this device, and then comes everything else. In, in the process of making them, though, I think the 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 various talents that come together to make these have to be really tightly integrated. So if the, the agency model sometimes may not work for this, that we subcontract different parts to different parts of the world and then try to bring it back together. Uh, to give you one example, if I look at a lot of phones right now, they, they're beautiful objects, but they almost look exactly the same. There's not a whole lot of variation now between phone to phone, even an iPhone to uh, another, another phone. So there, there's a physical aspect of designing this, but very importantly is the question of what's inside that box. So when you unlock that phone, what do you see? How do you interact with that? And there's people, designers, that write that narrative. Um, 
but they have to actually work very closely with the physical designers. Mm -hmm. And all of them have to work very closely with the mechanical engineers and electrical engineers. And mm -hmm. all those people have to come together to make a final product. So it takes visionaries to sort of envision what these devices do, mm -hmm. but also pretty tightly integrated teams to execute based on that vision. Mm -hmm. OK, I have one final question, and then we'll open this up to the audience. OK, we've got the wrist. We've got the watch. We now have sort of glasses. What are we going to have next? What is the actual wearable that people may wear? Well, it depends what the use is. Like if I was here right now and I had a little device hidden in my boot and maybe I could get my email and nobody could see that I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're bored. <laughs> OK, John? Um, uh, I think that we, we moved from pluggables mm -hmm. to wearables. And I think pluggables were great because they had power and everything. Uh, the wearable assumes you're losing a lot, but we want everything we had when we were pluggable. I think we have to get used to having less for wearables to succeed, really. Mm -hmm. Stefano? For what we do, the next step that is probably the most interesting for our, uh, our industry is uh, textile. Mm -hmm. This is something for sure that uh, could be an extra application. So far, uh, for what I know, there is nothing really... Oh, you talk to Dan. Dan. He can make a battery short. Okay. <laughs> so far, there is nothing really coming up that we were able to use, but uh, I believe that's really where maybe we can have a lot to say eventually on, on the development of the product. Mm -hmm. But I guess we have to wait when the military will uh, kind of let us yeah. see the next uh, technology coming out from that. So, so for me, two things. I'm actually still excited about the head-worn systems. Uh -huh. uh, I do think that Google Glass has to evolve multiple more steps before it's, uh, it's consumer-ready. But there are certain things that are unique to that particular form factor, including augmented reality. So in principle, someday in the future, I should be able to put a piece of digital art on that ball in the back of the ballroom, and you would see it through your head-mounted system. Other people will see different kinds of art. Uh, so there are a number of magical experiences that these systems can eventually offer people that are not really possible any other way. But uh, for me, actually, the ideal computing system would be maybe beyond wearables. Uh, when we instrument the environment so you don't have to carry any device at all with you, mm -hmm. and you can still use a computer. So someday we'll get there, and it'll be pretty interesting. Cool. Okay, questions from the floor? Anybody? Yeah, the microphone is coming. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It was a fascinating uh, conversation and hearing what you're having to say, but I, there was like a moment of everybody taking a deep breath when Diane said, hey, what about that little tumor I might get from wearing my Google Glass? <laughs> it's proven that you, when you put your cell phone up to your head, your physiology and your brain changes. There's much more glucose produced. You're supposed to carry your iPhone you know, a certain distance away from your head, so when you're putting these cuffs on your wrists and chains around your neck and you're becoming so hyper-connected, you're taking electromagnetic frequencies and microwaves that occur in the natural environment and then technologically enhanced, you're creating almost like when you take the sunshine and shine it through a magnifying, micro, micro, uh, thank you, magnifying glass and you're creating a fire. I mean, so there are these really strong chemicals and the things that are happening physiologically. And just like fashion is now looking into sustainability, I think it would be amazing if fashion were to look at wearables and think about you know, what is happening biologically to the human being, not just of a man or a woman, but a, a child, right? I mean, this is super important. So I'm curious. I mean, I have a patent pending on something that I think is really cool and interesting, and I'm wondering how you as the panel are envisioning and seeing how to bring this amazing technology that just makes us all so interconnected and such a wonderful community, but how to be smart and safe. Thank you. Do you guys have health requirements? Um, OK, I can take a step at it. Yes, there is definitely a number of standards, actually, for, for example, for RF radiation. And when we were doing our design, we decided to not only below that threshold, but be many orders of magnitude below that threshold just to net that take any chances to be 100% safe. But uh, you're very right, actually. For wearables, there's other, other uh, concerns. That, that If you have a bracelet, what is the impact of the material that the bracelet is made of on your skin? Because it's a chemical uh, polish on a 
piece of material is in contact with live cells, well, or at least the, the surface of Is the skin. Is that with batteries too? Yeah, there's, there's battery issues. Um, and you know, traditionally, the consumer electronic industry has not uh, looked very deeply into these issues because they kind of assume that maybe the phone is living in your pocket, maybe your computer is in your briefcase, but the wearable devices, if the field takes off, they're really actually close to your body, so we have to be very careful about those and definitely study them thoroughly before they go on people. Okay, another question? Um, I think you need to. <clears throat> you know what, I think, I think we should do a separate discussion about the health issues afterwards. There's a break. You are free to corner the back and continue <laughs> that. We're going to go to a question over here right now. Uh, yes, don't you think that the ones that are really going to love those uh, new technologies are, on one hand, the, the NSA and its equivalent, and on the other hand, the insurance companies? Because uh, it looks a little bit like the uh, George Orwell world coming uh, true, which is a, a kind of uh, irony for those who remember the famous clip about uh, Apple at the time. John, do you want to address that? <laughs> Uh, I have to say that I watch a lot of movies and I read a lot of articles about this problem question. Um, the only conclusion I've come to is that we've always been watched. Um, uh, it's, it's been a factor in life. Um, has it gotten worse? It's gotten a whole lot worse. Um, when you see what large companies can do now, it's pretty amazing. It's also pretty scary too. Um, I think it's one of those examples of something has happened that we cannot stop. And the question becomes, how, do, uh, how does philosophy uh, address this is the fundamental question, I believe. Okay. It's happened already. Two more questions, one there. I'm a little confused right now. Um, this is a luxury conference and it's like none I've ever seen before, and I congratulate both Vanessa and Deborah on that because it's a really a great breath of fresh air. Um, I've heard many people over the years define luxury, and luxury is not always fashion. There's a distinction between the two. And one thing I've heard many people agree upon is that in luxury objects, there's a certain timeless aspect to them. And I'm hearing a lot of talk about technology now, but I cannot think of any technology product that has ever been considered timeless. Would I ever want 25 years from now give an iPhone 6 to a grandchild? Mm. Probably not, but would I want to give them a watch that I bought today or a fine briefcase? Yes. So where is, can we get some definition around fashion, luxury, and technology? And what the difference is? Dan, you want to take that on? <laughs> um, well, if you give a beautiful leather briefcase to a 13-year-old today, I'm not sure he's going to like it that much. Not today, but... I mean, I gave... I, every year I would give my son a briefcase because I thought that would make him go to work. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's uh, um, you know, so, but you can, by the same token, I think that Apple is a luxury company. I think it is a luxury, it has created a luxury community. Now it has a CEO that came from Burberry. I mean, so... Um, so luxury and timelessness, um, I, the, I mean, if fax didn't exist, you got your first fax, oh, you felt so great. Now if you have a fax, people say, what is it? You know, so uh, the television, I mean, um, when I was a little girl, we had a television before there was any program and we just stared at this television. Um, it's... Um, I mean, technology, everything goes so fast in technology. 
And it's so amazing. I mean, 15 years ago, there was no internet. There was no, you know, I mean, a dictionary. I mean, a dictionary, that was the most precious thing. Your grandfather gave you the dictionary and you still had the dictionary. Now, a dictionary, what is it? I mean, you know, so it's sad in a way, but by the same token, you know, my grandchildren, they know as much geography as if they had all the atlases in the world. So you just have to go with it. I mean, I, I would say the confusion you're talking about is a confusion that is reflected in the fact that these borders are now so fluid. And people are trying to figure out what all these words mean in a brave new world. You know, it's what Will was talking about. I mean, it is a different world, and words mean different things. And we are using them, I think, um, as much as possible to try and understand what is the best usage, you know, what is the best practice. And, and actually, nature is all of it. It's technology, it's luxury, and it's whatever else. You, you, what was the third thing? Fashion. 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 Huh? Fashion. <laughs> okay, last, so, last. so maybe actually I, I would like, I'd like to add one quick point about that because I guess there's an element of being exclusive in luxury and a lot of things that we've considered in this meeting are made by hand, they're, they involve craftsmanship, they're living in the physical world. Something that traditionally we've not had is craftsmanship in that sense in the digital world and when, once you make a piece of software you can infinitely copy it at no cost which is definitely not the case in the, in the physical world. So we really don't have right now luxury software. Uh, I'm not sure if this ever be, will be created or not, or if it's going to be a good thing, but that's at least a topic for conversation. OK, one last question, and then everyone is free to um, ask the panel. There are other questions during the break. Gilbert. Um, this, has been, this has been very insightful. Um, you talked about, Diane mentioned, about what is coming next after the Google Glass. I'd like to ask the panel their predictions of what is going to be the next most interesting thing that comes out of all of this. I think we sort of what we sort of did that. Stefano said textiles. For, yeah, I For mean, it's, it's what we will look into, but maybe it's not wearable. No, for me, it's, it's not textiles, because I, I, I can't understand how that would work. But for me, it would be, again, if I had a you know, nice, beautiful cuff, and, uh, and I could actually get my email on it, I would like that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I, I can't stand them, but I think it's drones. Um, I think anything you can't stand, um, you, you'll have to make into something better. Um, there are so many things you can do with that that you cannot do with anything else. Um, they're bad for all the wrong, all the reasons we know, uh, but they are a new kind of enablement. Um, we don't have to wear them, so therefore they could be less safe. It could do be like a pin, and then they flew off into the air when you Again, to launch them. Again, uh, <laughs> who knows? But uh, an interesting space. It, it could potentially be immersive environments. Uh, so I want to have a disclaimer here that anybody who's tried to predict technology trends has been terribly wrong forever. So. Uh, but if I, I'm going to hazard a guess, I would say one of the interesting things on the horizon is immersive environments. So this ability to really transform you so you would feel you're somewhere else. It's uh, getting closer to that point. So we've seen glimmers of that. And uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes uh, in the next few years. Okay. One thing I would like to say is that I think that the best piece of technology that we all have is our brain. OK, thank you very much on that. I think we will end it.